Can we actually have a bit of a run through this comparison that you showed me? Because I know it's just kind of top level. It's We're talking averages. This isn't like an exact kind of thing, but it's enough to make you go, wow, okay, maybe there's some, some dollars here. Absolutely. I, I guess it points to the fact that, you know, you really do need to have a great property manager looking mm. after your investment. 100%. Yeah. If you want to maximise your return, they're, they're just lots of little things, but over a period of time, they add up to be a huge amount of dollars. And it's they're things that are really common amongst the industry that we see when we're picking up clients. Well, and for rental increases was one of the big ones as well. So what, what is your comparison? Because for memory, it was 2.5% to 4.5%. Was that right? Yeah. And I guess I just did that as a, a, a very base comparison. As we know, rents have increased quite significantly over a short period of time. Yep. Um, whereas we haven't had, you know, big increases prior to that. Mm -hmm. But I feel like... For the case of the comparison, it's pretty relevant. Well, and whether it's two and a half versus four and a half or whether it's zero versus two and a half, whatever it is, it, it is, it's relative as well. Yeah, it's just highlighting the fact that if you have a property manager who is not across what the market is doing and is saying to you, oh, yeah, you know, just a, a $10 increase, that how over a 10-year period that really can impact your overall return, which is massive. And the property that you've got as a bit of a dummy property here for the example, was it, it was $500 a week? Yeah, I just did a base rent, you know, so obviously there are way more expensive ones, but it just goes, it, so it would compound the, you know, the more expensive the property. Well, and if we're looking at 500 bucks a week, so it was a uh, vacancy, it was um, lack of rental increase, management, uh, not management, mismanagement, all this maintenance, whole bunch of stuff. What did it add up to over the 10 year period that you showed me? About $37,000. And that's when I was like, all right, you got my attention. And you know, I, I think that in all reality, it's Probably more than that. We've in in those figures. We've only included three, you know, three major things. One was, you know, rent. Um, another was unclaimed tenancy damages, which is so more prevalent than people are aware of, and I can't wait to talk about it. And the third one is an inefficient leasing process, so loss of loss of money during that. So in this example, we're talking about sort of thirty-seven or almost forty grand. Mm -hmm. Got that right? And so if we're basically Looking at one property, it's already enough. If we're looking at a portfolio of three, four, five properties, it's, it's almost 200 grand-ish, if my numbers are right. It's Either way, even if they're wrong, it's a lot of money over a 10-year period. We're talking about potential deposits missed out on to grow a portfolio. Correct. And I guess one of my main points from this is that, you know, for investors out there, they really need to focus on the quality of property management they're getting, not just the fee, because, mm -hmm. you know, the difference of... 1% of management might be $300 over the course of a year mm. and you'll recoup that in less than one week of the property being leased more efficiently. Mm. It's really important to look at the big picture and, and, and to be informed. And it's exactly why I thought this would be such a good timing for this episode because right now cash flow is the name of the game. We had a ton of interest rate rises over the past kind of, what is it, 12, 18 months, however long it's been now. Everyone's looking for, okay, so if I renovate this, if I can do this, how am I going to increase my cash flow? But this one looks at it from a different perspective. It's not so much upping the rent or lowering the rates, but it's lowering potential other running costs through things. And this is the biggest appeal to me. Things that you can just ask questions on, things that you're not getting there rolling up your sleeves, adding value, spending money to do this. You're being more of an informed property investor by asking the PM the right questions. Correct. And it's also about keeping an actual eye on your investment. You know, if you've got the right property manager, so many times we have clients, I'm, you even said that you're guilty of this yourself. Unfortunately. Um, where, you know, you have your portfolio managed, you're tr you have trust in that agency who mm -hmm. is managing it, but you do need to keep an eye on it. The number of times that we have clients switch to us and, you know, they haven't looked at their property for five or six years and they're utterly mortified, you mm. know. Um, to discover the state of disrepair that their property is in because they've not bothered to open their routine inspection reports and have a little look. You know, they're completely, uh, you know, unaware. So crucial that you are keeping an eye. Try and um, look at your property, you know, every couple of years um, to have the confidence that the property manager that you have is doing the right thing. All right, and I thought the way that we could run through this is something that is the issue 
Okay. Mm-hmm. So whether we're talking about vacancy, whether we're talking about damage, whatever it is, maybe a little bit of a, an anecdote to sort of put it in perspective. For sure. And then if we can talk about a solution and a real tangible takeaway for everyone, if they've got a question that they can ask to like mm-hmm. arm them with a list of four or five questions, however it is, and they can just put this into practice straight away. All right, Beck, with that said, what's the first cab off the rank for us? I guess making sure that you have a property manager who is super proactive in identifying tenant damage, whether it be accidental Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, through poor living and is making sure that those items and or issues are being addressed during tenancy so that a landlord is not left with a, a hefty maintenance bill at the end of tenancy that's not covered by the bond. So if I've understood you right, what you see on the the negative side of things is stuff that could be little bits and pieces done along the way of a tenant living there is just kind of all left to the end and ends up being a, a bigger issue to deal with because it's multiple things and maybe the bond doesn't cover it. Absolutely. And gotcha. it's, it's super common. And they're not necessarily um, things that are caused by a tenant um, being a bad tenant. Mm-hmm. Um, it, we all know through the course of living that things happen. So think things like um, vehicles leaking oil on driveways, um, accidental damages, people are manoeuvring furniture, you know, they might scrape the beautiful solid floorboards or they might, you know, take a chunk out of a wall or, um, you know, in the instance of poor garden maintenance, for example, you know, like making a tenancy, making the property slowly diminish in overall value because what once was a beautiful back lawn has not been watered at all and now mm. it's a bit of a dust bowl. Um, those are the sorts of things that need to be tackled during the tenancy, you know, pointing out to the tenant that it is their responsibility to water weed and mow and that, you know, that's the expectation so that, you know, that lawn is maintained throughout the course of the tenancy. Why do you reckon it is that it doesn't get done? Is it is it a bit of a potential CBF from some property managers or is it just like a, well, no, that's not a part of our process. We leave it to the end. That's how it's always been done. Uh, oh, look, probably a little bit of both. Um, but, you know, having those conversations for a property manager um, can be tricky and it's about how they're tackled on a really positive way so that your relationship with the tenant is still really positive. You know, it doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to be difficult. So I guess it's to do with the training from above um, and making sure that that's part of the culture of the company that you're in, that that's just, you know, normal. All right, so if someone's listening now and they're thinking, all right, I can, I can see this and, and maybe they've had a bad experience with it, what's a question they should be asking if they're either talking with their PM currently or looking at switching PMs? A really good question would be, how do you tackle accidental damage during the course of a tenancy? So just straight up, just like point to the elephant. Absolutely. Like it might be something like, um, you know, We see lots of accidental burn marks to laminex, you know, where the kids have made pancakes and put the hot pan on the laminex and then there's a massive big burn. Mm -hmm. It may be that the property manager needs to be proactive, the landlord's building insurance policy might need to be taken into effect. Some tenants have got accidental damage tenancy policies. We can use that. It's about making sure that that's addressed during the tenancy, done, dealt with so that there's not a, you know, a big downtime at the end of the tenancy to get all of these things rectified. I was about to ask you what's the answer you want to hear, but I guess it's exactly what you just said. That that's that's what you want to hear if you're asked that question. Correct. Yeah. Okay, cool. Moving on to, to number two. So we're talking about inefficient inefficient if I can talk properly, <laughs> inefficient <laughs> leasing process. Yeah. So this is a, a um really common thing, I guess. So firstly, we know to get more feet through the door, you need good marketing. So professional images, floor plans go an exceptionally long way to minimising um, downtime. Yep. But it's also about, so say for example, a tenant is breaking lease or, you know, you know that it's at the end of the tenancy, not waiting until that tenant is vacated to then show prospective tenants. It's about having that great relationship with the tenant that's vacating, teeing up open inspection times so that you're reference checking and, you know, doing all of that process so that you've got your next tenant teed up and ready to move in a week, a week later so that it's all, um, you're minimising the, the vacancy time. That just sounds, that, it sounds like the way it should be done. 
But it's, it's just not all the time, is no, it? No, it's not. And it's really important. You know, if you're talking $500 a week, an extra two weeks of a property vacant is $1,000. And mm. so many times, you know, prospective investors are so focused on, oh, what's my management percentage and, and saving money on um, overall fees. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, a really, a really great agent that might cost an extra – $300 over the course of the year, in actual fact, will save you thousands by, mm. and, you know, and, with good management. And play with this with what Beck's saying as well. If you go to pizzaandproperty.au and actually click on, there's a resources tab, a cash flow calculator, put everything in. There's like side-by-side calculators. Play with the management fee and watch just how much it doesn't change anything. Like it's obviously you don't want to be paying 15% or anything crazy, but I hear what you're saying. Like when, especially when it's half a percent, a percent, like these tiny little differences, you're talking about potentially saving a few hundred, but then it's potentially, especially if you go on full bargain basement, going to cost you thousands. Ah, oh, I've got an example of a bargain basement. Yeah, sure. Oh, one of our very best, like I was devastated. He, he left us, he had quite a large portfolio of properties, um, and I couldn't meet the bargain basement price that he had been offered elsewhere. Yep. And um, so I did leave um, our management for a couple of years to go elsewhere. He has an amazing portfolio of really uh, higher end properties. Does he want to jump on the show? <laughs> <laughs> and he might, I'll have to ask him. Um, but sadly, you know, those properties were not being um, managed well enough when he brought his portfolio back to us. Um, which came about simply because one of the properties properties he had had been sitting there vacant for seven weeks, and so he said seven oh. weeks. Yeah, so he said, "Okay, well, you know, can you have a look?" And um, we went and looked at the property, and it was only two and a half years old, and it had been patch painted throughout. The carpets had been clawed by cats. It was fairly dirty. The lawns had, you know, pretty much disappeared in the backyard. It desperately needed mowing and just, you know, gardening to, to improve its presentation. So no longer, you know, no wonder it had sat there vacant for seven weeks. And there was about $5,000 worth of repairs that needed to happen to get this near new property back up to speed. Was this because he wasn't wanting to do it or he wasn't aware of it? Or? He was not aware at all because just like you, Todd, yeah. has full faith in, <laughs> you, know, said anything. <laughs> you know, and look, there are amazing agents out there. There are plenty of mm-hmm. wonderful property management companies, but, you know, he had trust that, you know, these things were happening. He's busy. You know, he has a large portfolio of properties. He hadn't opened his routine reports. He didn't mm-hmm. know. So anyway, that was how it came about that he then, you know, we got that one sorted and he decided to come back. But then as we were doing our routine inspections, we discovered properties that um, had masses of water damage that should have been addressed under, you know, building maintenance contracts um, from new builds. New bril- yeah, okay. Correct. Whereas that period of time had expired, heaps of tenant damage where, you know, carport pillars had been reversed into, not claimed under vehicle insurance claims. Just the list is enormous. You know, rent increases that um, he believed that he was getting where rent increase notices had been sent to the tenant, um, but they had not um, signed their lease extensions, so the rent increase is null and void, so they were continuing on now as periodic tenancies without any rent increases, Um, or just maintenance that hadn't been addressed. The list was huge. A a nightmare for this guy. uh, Well, it was a nightmare for us, actually, (laughs) (laughs) when we took it back on, but... We have kept a spreadsheet and it's in the vicinity of 30,000 plus um, of lost, whether it be um, rent or in maintenance that has occurred that should have been claimed in other ways or forms. So, How many properties was that over? 15. 15. So he's got a big portfolio. Yeah, although some of them there was nothing to claim, whereas others the claim was significant with regards to, you know, maintenance repairs. This is exactly what I mean. Like it's it, it's when you're talking about saving on cash flow, it's it's kind of the don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Actually, I don't know if I'm using that saying right, but <laughs> either way, like, look look at what's really important. Mm. And and for me then, so insufficient leasing process. We're talking about potential vacancies that just shouldn't happen because the things that should be happening, lining the tenant up, any little bits of maintenance should either be getting done along the way of the the tenant actually being there. Or I'm assuming this is more like a, all right, the lease is up in six weeks, they're not renewing, let's start doing this process now versus, oh, hey, Mr. Mrs. Landlord, 
it's vacant, I'm going to start the the process now. Have I understood right? Correct. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's about educating your tenants along the way. You know, if the property manager isn't explaining to the tenant that, hey, it's your responsibility to be, you know, watering that lawn and mowing mm-hmm. it, um, you know, so many people are not really aware of what their obligations are. So it's an education process. What's the question someone should be asking then? Uh-huh. Make sure that they're avoiding someone that just doesn't have a leasing process. Because I, I feel like if you say, hey, do you have a leasing process? The answer will be like, yes. I guess the question would be, you know, what is the follow-up process when you discover issues during a routine inspection? How do, how do they tackle that? Okay, so what's the follow-up process when you discover issues through a routine tenant inspection? Yep. I like it. Okay. Moving on, we're looking at um, no or weak rental increases. Now, this is a this is both a touchy one and a very important one. How do you want to tackle this, Beck? Yeah, well, I guess it is crucial that, you know, a landlord is given actual market data on mm-hmm. what their property is worth. So, you know... Just having a property manager who's just doing a bit of a, oh, yeah, you know, a $10 increase because they are not being kept aware or informed is, as you can see by the spreadsheet, Mm. super costly. Um, On another note, though, whilst it is critical to always try and maximise your rental return, I want to preface it by saying it is also um, can be really worthwhile caring Um, and giving a really amazing tenant um, a bit of a rental discount because we know that great tenants, they maintain the property's investment value and Mm. they can save you lots of money over long term. Where's that line? What do you feel is usually like the, all right, it's worth it because you're taking a bit of a haircut here, but like over here is going to look much better. Yeah, look, I guess it's, it's very, what we see is it's very different depending upon the individual investors. So those investors that have had their property for a really long period of time and, you know, whether their, you know, mortgage is nearly paid off, they've got a whole lot more room to play with and tend to be far more generous yep. um, versus, you know, those that really, on you know, need every cent. And there's no right or wrong. Um, but, you know, you obviously don't want to lose a fantastic tenant over a 10 or $15 a week because the costs to relet the property outweigh any benefit. So if you've got a really mm. amazing tenant and you're, you know, quabbling over 10 or $15, I guess it's really worth considering whether or not it, it is worth moving them on for that. Okay. And, and so as far as actually getting a solid rental increase, balancing that with looking after a good tenant, where are the things that you see people or not people, property managers go wrong when it comes to actually increasing like to, to good, strong rental or yeah, increasing the rental yield, I guess it really comes back to. It needs to be about being informed. So they need access to tools, whether it be RP data or, you know, really actively looking on realestate.com or mm-hmm. other, you know, sources to really see what properties are leasing for in that area. Be informed before you make recommendations. Because I've got, we talked about this off air before, I've got a friend who will remain nameless that was bragging to me how wonderful their PM was because they they were down south and they were, they hadn't got a, a rental increase because the PM was so lovely and it was like $300 a week. And they were like, oh, they're such a, such a good person. And I was like, no, they're not. Like that should be renting out for like 500 bucks a week. Like it was, it was huge. It wasn't just like, oh, like you're saying $15, good tenant, look after them. And I'm looking at that kind of stuff and thinking, I don't know if you, you have ever experienced or hear anecdotes about that of maybe the, the PM, I don't know, is it a feel sorry for? It goes, oh, no, well, you know, like I don't want to do that to you. It's too much of a rental increase or do you have any experience on that side? Uh, look, from taking over some properties, yeah, and I guess where that would be driven from is I guess the ultimate blame comes from the top, so whoever is owning the company because the, the PM needs to be educated in how to get that data, what the company process is surrounding rent increases and, you know, if they're left to their own devices and do those sorts of things, I guess that's where... They can get away with it. Yeah, the poor landlord really does miss out. Mm. So what questions should people be asking a PM to make sure that they're actually getting a a solid but reasonable rental increase in in line with the market? Yep. So that's a a real basic one is what is your, your process around rental increase recommendations and 
what you would be looking for is that it is data based, you know, that they are doing some form of research on it on another platform and actual comparisons across the suburb, not just internally. You know, if you if you've got a company that's only looking after a hundred or two hundred properties, they might only have you know, two properties in that suburb. So you've not got an accurate comparison when there may maybe 50 rentals in that suburb. So 100 sounds like a lot, but for an agency, that's not a lot, is it? No. No, okay. All right, so that way it's not just about looking on RP data or whatever platform for comparison. It's also about boots on the ground, like real life experience comparison of we just let X, because that's the other thing with RP data is sometimes the letting fee, not letting fee, sorry, the, the letting price and the price that was advertised are two completely different things. And then if you're just going off of what was advertised, but they actually got 25 bucks a week more or whatever it was, that could be a huge difference. Yeah. And sadly in South Australia, we don't have access to um, getting the actual leased figures, which is a little bit frustrating. But Mm. for us as an agency, I guess we're what would be termed medium size, I guess, with 1,200 properties. So we do tend to be able to pull lots of data internally but looking across multiple platforms is how you you know how you can draw comparisons and are you actually wanting those reports sent to you as an investor because i've got mixed experience with that sometimes i get them sent sometimes i don't uh, look i think it depends how many that like i just said there is multiple sources that we draw upon so whilst you might be able to get a comparison report from rp data mm-hmm. we might also then there might not be something that's enough comparables on RP data, whereas we might have looked on realestate.com at other things that are currently in the market at that time. Mm -hmm. We might have looked at what we personally have achieved for rentals that may have been off market, so they're not appearing on RP data Mm -hmm. um, because it's really common that we do rent things off market. You know, we've got a large portfolio. If we've got um, a fantastic tenant that's property is being sold, you know, we will you shuffle. Just connect the dots in the background. Absolutely. It happens all the time. So, it, you know, then that data is not available online. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a physical report. Mm. Sometimes the physical report is fabulous and really can point to, um, you know, what we're trying to push, but not always. All right, Beck. Number four. Poor tenant selection and excess damage. This is uh, one that can really cost a lot. Absolutely, it can. Where do you want to go from here? What's the best starting point? Well, I guess it's about making sure that the tenancy selection process um, with your property manager is really rigorous so that they are doing all of the appropriate checks and balances so that they're making sure that they've spoken to the previous property manager, that they know that the property was well cared for, they know that the property was left in a good state of repair Mm -hmm. when the tenant vacated Um, because what we know is a a property that has not been cared for, A, it diminishes in its overall value um, but B, it makes it very difficult to continue to secure the highest amount of rent that you're trying to achieve for that property. So if a tenant has been in a property and you know, going back to what we talked about at the beginning of the episode, you know, they've never bothered to water the lawns or, um, you know, carpets have not been cared for throughout the course of the tenancy and then all of a sudden you've got all of these really, you know, manky carpets, you know, the next great tenant doesn't want to move into that. That Okay, this is really interesting because this isn't about, oh, the property's falling apart, you haven't renovated, it's old, I'm not paying more. It's like over a long enough time horizon, if all the little bits of tenant damage aren't seen to, it can be looked through with that same lens of, I'm not paying this extra rent because Correct. look at the property. Correct. But if you take a step back, it's like, yeah, but that was potentially things that should have been getting done by the tenant if there were tenant damage. Yeah, okay, I see where you're going with that. Absolutely. So, like, during a tenancy, you have to allow for fair wear and tear. You know, that means there'll be a few marks on the walls, there'll be a few marks on the floor. But fair wear and tear is not a cat clawing away at the carpets and the blinds. Mm -hmm. Fair wear and tear is not excessive drink spills um, that are causing permanent stains over carpets. Mm. Um, Fair wear and tear is not... um, you know, stains in kitchen tile grout that is turning tile grout black, um, you know, and making a kitchen have that, you know, icky feel that it's not a nice clean space. Um, So 
that's where tenancy selection and referring back to when you've got those great tenants who are, you know, the tile grout's always lovely, the carpets are always clean, you know, you're then not up for either a tribunal hearing at the end of tenancy um, because you've got a claim that will be over and above the bond, which is then very difficult to get those funds from the tenant if it's above the bond, um, you yeah. know. Is that a bit of false sense of security that you find a lot of investors have? It's like, oh, it's all right, like I'll get it at the bond, but it's like a lot of the time if there's problems, they're outside the bond's amount? Absolutely, yeah, Um, which is why, as we pointed to earlier, it's critical that when you're sourcing an agent that they are ensuring that these things are dealt with during the tenancy. You want to minimise any of this happening at end of tenancy. Having said that, there will... There will be the odd occasion um, where a property can deteriorate in, uh, you know, in presentation in a short period of time. Because the other side of that as well as an investor, if you're, again, looking at this over a longer time horizon of however many years, you're growing your portfolio, you're at number two, you're about to buy number three, and it's like, great, number one and number two, they've gone up in value. Let's get the valuer out there and let's extract some equity. And if all of a sudden that you've got these two properties that maybe you've had them for four or five years, it's all starting to deteriorate. It's not looking as good. It's not only the physical, like, or not physical, the upfront cost that you're potentially looking at. You might get a value that's like, oh, this is only worth five fifty now. When maybe beforehand, if it was presented nice, the maintenance was done correctly, maybe they would have put five seventy, five eighty. Like again. There's all of these little bits and pieces that you just don't think of until someone like yourself comes along and points them out. Correct. And then on top of that, so your your property value is diminished, so you you know you've got less equity in there, but then you're having to um, do your proactive maintenance far more frequently. So the house needs a repaint more frequently. You mm-hmm. know, there's four thousand um, dollars. Your carpet. That's, that's a cheap one these days. <laughs> <as well. laughs> yeah. Your carpet needs to be um, replaced more frequently. You know, whereas going back to what we talked about earlier with regards to a great tenant that you might give a ten dollar a week discount to. You know, we've got some great tenants. Oh, my goodness, you know, they can live in a property for 10 years and the carpet still looks immaculate. Mm. You know, no need to replace the carpet because they're amazing. On the maintenance side of things, uh, this is something that I hear of a bit in the industry, but I don't know really how prevalent it is. But then uh, a PM that's basically skimming 10%, 20% off the top with like uh, trade referrals. And I've always kind of looked at that and thought, okay, if it's transparent, I guess, but sometimes it's not transparent. I've heard people complain about that. What's your experience there? Do you see that a bit or? Uh, I, not so much in the southern states. Um, I do know that there are software, like third-party software um, platforms that specialise in maintenance um, because I've been showing them, um, where they will then charge the tradie for receiving work orders through the platform and that's how they're paid for, which no doubt the tradie would then completely on charge to um, a that, landlord. That's it, yeah. Um, but then, yes, what you are just saying is you need to look at um, your fee proposal because there are instances where companies will say, we will take, for example, 5 or 10% of maintenance work that we arrange for you, yep. um, which can significantly add up. So say, for example, you've got, um, you know, your property management company who've just organised a, a repaint and, you know, new carpets, which is two very simple, straightforward tasks. And if they're taking 10% of a $3,000, um, you know, carpet replacement, you know, there's 300 bucks that you've just paid for them to arrange carpet replacement. So, When you are looking at your fees, you do want to be very mindful. And, you know, this points to when you're comparing fees, you know, do a full fee comparison. Don't Mm. just look at the management percentage. You know, we are often doing fee comparisons for potential clients because they might say to us, oh, you know, you're dearer on management percentage. But then when we look at the overall picture, Um, So when you're taking into consideration the letting fee and then some companies might charge for a routine inspection fee and, you know, there's this and that, you might do a comparison. We might be dearer in an overall management percentage but work out to be cheaper or, you know, the difference is so negligible it's irrelevant and people are quite surprised at that and like, oh, 
because this the focus has been management fee driven only. You need to look at the entire picture. Mm, couldn't agree more. All right, Beck, on the poor tenant selection, excess damage side of things, what's what's a question that you're arming investors with? Uh, I guess the key takeout from this one is you would need to be asking your property management agency is how do you make your tenancy selection and recommendations? Mm -hmm. Um, What checks are they carrying out? And do you get to see a a copy of the tenancy application? Okay, so actually ask to to have a look at it yourself. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay, because that way you guess there's there's no interpretation, but it's in black and white for both of you. Yeah, critical. Okay. All right. We're coming towards the the pointy end of things here, but number five on the list, I've got inexperienced or poorly trained PMs. I've had a bit of experience with this before, unfortunately, but um, where did you want to start with this one? Well, I guess everything that we've just talked about, all of those things occur in the instance that you have an inexperienced or poorly trained property manager, because Mm -hmm. They haven't got, I guess, the training, the skills, the processes to be following to ensure that these things are just part and parcel of how they manage a property day to day. Um, but then it can also be costly in other factors in that it's so crucial when we do our routine inspections that we're A, looking for proactive maintenance you know, an inexperienced property manager may not be across that. You know, it's also our role to be identifying, you know, any potential um, risk, uh, you know, balustrades that are damaged, um, those sorts of things. But also having the knowledge of how to best deal with those issues in a manner that it's going to, um, you know, you're always trying to maximise the outcome for your landlord, mm-hmm. but obviously fairly. You're never going to try and get a tenant to pay for something that's not their responsibility. Of course. But it may be that you're needing to look at an insurance claim scenario or a classic example. We just took over management of a property for a landlord. Nat, one of our property managers, she went, she did her first routine inspection rings him up and says, oh, are you aware that you've got all of this um, salt damage? And he says, yes, I am. You I've know, been saving I've, for it for a while. I've been saving for it. And she goes, oh, well, it won't be your responsibility. That's strata, you know. And he was like, what? You know, and she's like, yeah, no, it's the structure of the building. That's strata. And he, like, has jumped for joy and, you know, gets a hold of strata issues. Like, they were interested in seeing her quotation issue has been dealt with, no $26,000 to the owner. That's not an everyday scenario. Of course, but still that paints the picture of that would have been so easy for someone that was a little bit more fresh to the industry to just walk past it and go, oh, yeah, of course you've got to pay for that. Yeah, yeah. So just – and, you know, about making sure that you're framing insurance claims in the correct manner so that there is no decline of an insurance claim from a company – um, oh, the, the list goes on and on and on. Is that like the old, uh, if the plumber says it's burst, not leaked, that, that kind of <laughs> stuff? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, um, all of those things are really critical to make sure that your investment is, is maintained to the best of its standard. So I would imagine, like just from personal experience as well, you usually get a feel if someone's like inexperienced. There's just a bit of that like, oh, I think they're a bit like fresh. But is there something that someone that is really experienced on the PM side of things would just be able to answer like that, whereas someone that's fresh out of like real estate college or whatever it's called these days would just be stumped? I guess one of the basic questions, but we've already touched on it, is, you know, how do you deal with, you know, if you're going and you're doing a routine inspection and you discover, you know, tenant damage, how do you deal with that? You know, and what you are looking for is a proactive answer to that question. Um, And I guess you could also ask, have you had any experience with insurance claims? Um, But having said that, you know, if you're with a company that there's a lot of benefits to being with a company that is sizable because then you've got an entire team's worth of knowledge. You know, the number of times in our team people are swiveling their chairs and saying, oh, my God, has this ever happened to you before, you know? And Mm. there's a huge knowledge base there amongst a a larger team. You know, we've got girls that have been there for 15 years, you know, and and even they haven't seen every scenario in property management. 
Yeah, I'd imagine there's still stuff that you look at every now and then. You're like, wow, this is even a new one. Like real estate really is a, an ever evolving game. Absolutely. So, so long as, you know, you might have a more inexperienced PM, but so long as they are backed by a team of knowledge, you'll still be safe. Okay. So there's not really like a, a, an isolated question with this one. It feels like we've got a bit really a, of a crossover when it comes to, have you got any experience around claims? Like what is your process around tenant damage? Like we're basically leaning back on that as a bit of a double up. Yeah. So you might have someone who says, well, I personally don't. However, you know, X, Y, and Z in our team is who we go to for that. Great. You know, what I'd look forward with that is the confident answer. Because to me, I've always been of the opinion of if someone says, hey, actually, I don't know that, but let's find that out. Fabulous. Totally different to, oh, fumble, fumble, fumble. And we're going to tell you something that sounds good. But then I think, no, I don't, that the trust is broken there. Yeah. And look, that points to why it is so critical. You know, you're talking a half a million dollar, at least, investment Mm. in your property once a year, at least open up your routine inspection reports and have a look, you know. Um, if you live in the same state as your property occasionally, you know, it doesn't have to be every year, um, whatever, you know, you'll build a relationship with your property manager over time and mm. if you then know that, oh, yep, she's definitely got my back or he, she, um, you know, you can probably relax a little bit more but don't relax until, you know, it's proven. Mm. Yeah. Because these little things can be going on in the background and you are oblivious. And add up to $37,000. Absolutely. <laughs> that still blows my mind. All right, what's an action step back for someone that's listening to this going, okay, yeah, I probably dropped the ball a little bit. Maybe I'm a bit like Todd, don't check my statements as much as I should be, too much trust in a PM, whatever it is. What's something they can pull out the headphones right now, put into practice straight away? Okay, we probably just touched on one, but my number one action step would be, you know, hopefully you're with a company that has got a a portal, open up your landlord portal and go through the last few routine inspection reports. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're happy with the status of, um, you know, how your property is is looking. Um, So that would be number one. Um, Number two might be do a little bit of research on, um, you know, weekly rents make you know it might be that you seek advice from another property management company to, to say hey you know can you just give me a um an, a market appraisal for my get investment property yep get yep. a comparison and it may be that obviously you know rents have escalated i'm just going to give a little disclaimer here because sure. rents have escalated a huge amount in the last 12 months so you know if you're a, a little bit under and you're waiting another six months until your rent can go up in this market that is you know feasible whereas if you're significantly under well then that would point to ah you know why mm. why was i not told this like it back We've arrived at arguably the most important question of the entire show. I need to ask you, Beck Day, what is your favourite pizza? Um, I do like a bit of a, a margarita, but with a few prawns sprinkled on the top. Oh, you're feeling fancy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you getting it from anywhere in particular or are you making it at home? Oh, they stopped doing them, but yeah, um, no, make it home. Make it home. Like you go full wood style, like wood oven pizza or? No. No? No, nah, not, not quite as fancy as that. Okay. All right. Prawn pizza, margarita. Yeah. Love it. All right, Beck. are there any final words of wisdom or anything you'd like to leave with our listeners today that are really looking to maximize their returns on this one? I guess the final words of wisdom are, you know, if you've made those checks and you're not happy or if you're, you know, you're concerned you know, do your research, go and investigate other property management companies. It is so simple to switch agencies. That agency does it for you, basically. So don't be afraid of moving if you're unhappy with the service that you're getting. Love it. Look into it, move if you need to, because it's going to save you a lot of money as we've learned today. Correct. Find an agent that truly does have you back. Beautiful. Beck Day from Trove Property Management. Thank you so much for jumping on the show. Pleasure. Thanks for having me.